um <laughs> What up, everybody? It is the Exit 52 crew. Had a quick five second, ah, boy, going on there. Hopefully you caught the beginning of that. A little bit funny. I uh, had a little snafu during the playoffs once too, but it is Spencer Schultz coming live with one Barstool Bank. It's Eric Arditi, really off to a hot start here. Monday night, March 25th. We are on the eve of the eve of the eve of opening day coming live to you. Wanted to hop on and give a full Exit 52 2024 season preview. And boy, oh boy, is there a lot to talk about. This Orioles team has been just in the headlines nonstop for the last like month and a half after somewhat of a quiet start here. So with that, Eric, Brian, how are we feeling, boys? We're good. We're excited. Very That's excited. That's it. <laughs> I'm just I'm I I don't want to get too like too over the top hyped right now. No, this is, I, it, this is like it, Ryan going on his first sales call. Are you excited? Yeah. Are you really excited? It's a great week. Um, like you said, I mean they've been all over the news, the media kind of cycle. Um, I'm trying to find it. Like my boy Jacob Calvin Meyer, Hoko boy, Howard County guy, tweeted it this morning. And what did he say? Friday. He said that the timeline for the Orioles the last couple of days. Friday, Jackson Holiday gets notified that he's going to the minors. Saturday, Peter Angelos dies at 94. Um, damn it, where are the rest of the I'm trying to find it. What happens Sunday? Um, damn it, where is it? I'm losing it. Oh, here it is. Sunday club wraps up Brett best spring training in franchise history, Grapefruit League champions. Uh Wednesday, the or the the MLB voters owners are voting to uh officially approve the uh, O's deal with David Rubenstein, which will be approved press conference coming on Wednesday, been told. Uh, and then Thursday, I guess if you want to say it right now, is opening day, wink, wink, Friday probably due to the weather. But yeah, it's it's been a um, it's been a, a, an action packed last couple of days. Uh, again, it's starting with Jackson on Friday and, and Peter's death on uh, Saturday, which is obviously always very sad. But uh Again, we're turning the page to the 2024 Orioles, and and it's everyone is just I we just we want it to be Thursday or Friday, whichever one already. It's just it's going to be an awesome time, um, regardless of what day it is. And and I'm pumped. I know everybody else is, and I'm just I'm ready to get it going. Brian, how are we feeling tonight? Feeling awesome. I mean, Eric kind of came in with, oh, you know, I'm excited. I'm trying not to be too excited. It's like hell. We got a hundred one win baseball team, or no? What was the number last? One hundred one, right? One hundred one. Yeah. Yeah. We should only be getting better. We just added top five pitcher in the league who like, we don't do that. That never happens. And he's pitching opening day for us. We've got the best prospect in baseball. He's not even on the team. He's going to show up at some point. Like there are so many things trending upwards and reasons. And it, honestly, you look at it going into last year too. And you looked at the success they had in, in 2022 and you're like, well, with the way things are trending, I can only see them getting better. And what did they do? They were like 20 wins better, mm -hmm. 15 wins, 20 wins better. And they won the division running away. Like there's definitely a point of diminishing returns, especially in the game of baseball, when you get to that hundred win mark. But um, I don't know. It's, it's dangerous territory to think that it's hard to imagine this team taking a step backwards or at least a significant one. Like the AL East all, and we'll, we'll dive into that, I'm sure, um, have reloaded and they're back at it and they know what they're up against with us. But gosh, do you do you sit here and think we're any worse than we were at September 30th last year? I mean, I know the playoff, you know, it was disappointing and it was a flop, but like, why would we be worse? That's exciting to think about. It's very and for how much contention there is, I feel like since Adley Rushman came up, the Orioles have just done nothing but take series, win, be consistent, you know, be able to, to bounce back there. So with this season set to take off this Thursday or possibly Friday, do want to emphasize that the boys will be doing our first ever Orioles and Tailgoat 
live stream from the Jimmy's Seafood Tailgoat here. Have our graphic showing up there. 328, maybe 329. We're going to be there. If you're heading to Jimmy's, DJ Pauly D, tons of food, tons of drinks, tons of fun. So be sure to stop by. We'll have a little setup there. So super excited for that. Ultimately, yeah, we can Brady bunch it, whatever way, this way, that way. So really fired up for that. Come stop by if you're going. Jimmy's man. This is the Jimmy Seafood 2024 season preview. Eric, you got the Gunner Burger. I'm jealous. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of pissed about that. I wanted that Gunner Burger for a while. How, give, give me a give me a 10 point rating of the Gunner Burger before you hop on in. I've already said it's like a 13 out of 10. It's delicious. Fried pickles on the bottom, bacon. Um, they didn't have the the helmet, the mini helmet for the cheese, which was personally I'm I'm fine with that. But they were like, usually if we don't have the helmets, we don't sell the burger. And I was like, just just give me a burger. I get a damn helmet for my cheese. Like I'll eat it. It was so good. I I can't wait. Um, you all, you mentioned Paulie D. You didn't even talk about the the other big name. Nick Mark is going to be who I think coming on the pod. Uh, Brady Anderson, your mom's favorite baseball player. Um, definitely have to talk to him about racing. I know it's been on Brian's uh, bucket list for a while to talk to him about uh, about some of his uh, antics back in uh, Good Old Charm City when he was here. But uh, I'm 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 so excited that tail goes to be incredible. So it's it's I'm very excited for that. It'll be a lot of fun, and I'm starting to slowly plan out my day and what time I am going to be at Pickles before I get to the tailgate. I want to let everybody know. They open at six. Your boy, there's a good chance I'll be there at six. So come on by, get some bre breakfast with the boys before we uh, hop on the live stream. Love it. Feel like you got the fresh cut already. You're you're ready. You've oh. been hibernating for months, I feel like, in preparation of exactly Thursday. And then you're about to be reborn just before Easter. Just absolutely apropos there. So baseball season is back. Boys are pumped up. Um, on, a, on a more sour note, want to kick it off here, going through the run sheet, Peter Angelos does pass away uh, i believe at the tender age of 94 there unfortunately at the uh the gbmc the greater baltimore medical center there in towson been sick for quite some time the family released a statement please you know don't send flowers just donate to charity uh which which is a really baller move in my opinion uh to, to release was part of the statement so synonymous with baltimore people have many thoughts on angelos nonetheless is uh you know i feel like people in the 90s might remember him a little differently and and again we weren't here for the whole thing and uh, weren't adults for it, but want to you know give condolences to the Angelos family, and it's uh, definitely unfortunate to to lose someone and someone that's been a staple of Baltimore and this team for quite some time. So definitely sad news on Saturday, and whew, just part of the whirlwind of news that you mentioned from Jacob Calvin Meyer's tweet. So uh, initial thoughts on that. Any anything else, guys? Ryan, I'll I'll, I'll tee right. this one up for you if you, if you got anything. <laughs> R.I.P. R.I.P. We can leave it at that. Uh, with uh, that. <laughs> staring contest on Twitter for about 20 minutes there. Well, well, I, well, well. I will say, <laughs> I, I, I will say again, I don't know if you guys read the, um, the article that Britt Giroli and, um, Dan Connolly wrote in the athletic about Angelos and all that. And I tweeted out one of the excerpts today from it. Um, the whole story, again, it talked about how Angelos and we knew him as the owner and all that stuff. And, I didn't, I, Brian, you may, you may have remembered this, but they talked about how he, you know, he was burned by some bad deals. Bobby Bonilla, um, Albert Bell, some of those, obviously Chris Davis later, but in 2006, he turned down, he declined a trade. They had it in place. Where was it? Um, with the Phillies to get Bobby Abreu in 2006, who ended up going to the Yankees. And I think had like a decent, he was fine for the Yankees. Um, they were, they were trading away. Rodrigo Lopez, who had lost 18 games that year, like, and he, and he, but he turned that down. It was too risky, blah, 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 the money or whatever. But I thought that was kind of interesting. I had no clue about that. Um, and then the other, the other article that I tweeted out was how, um, how much Angelus donated. Like you talked about that spending about how, you know, he donated to hospitals and all that stuff all the time. And how, I guess, after Dan Duquette had left the Orioles, his daughter needed a uh, liver transplant. Was it liver or kidney? Kidney. Uh, his daughter needed a kidney transplant and he was going to donate it to her. They couldn't get on the list to like get the surgery done um, in Maryland because of insurance purposes. So they would have had to get it done in another state and it would have cost like over $350,000. And apparently Duquette and, and Angelos were talking one day and uh, Duquette mentioned that to him. 
Angelo, so they said he hung up. He made a call. And the next day, the surgery was approved. They got it done in Baltimore. And, you know, Duquette's daughter has lived a, um, a very normal and, and healthy life ever since then. And they ended that that story with uh, a quote from Duquette. He was a tough son of a bitch, one of the toughest lawyers and negotiators you could ever come across. But he had this soft human side that I really don't think he wanted people to know about. But I got to witness it. So, again, I we give we've given him and his family shit for 25 30 30 years now you know and st the story the stories like that that come out always kind of make you just like ah again maybe he wasn't the best owner i think we know that he he's you know the owner of the worst stretch that this franchise will probably ever see but it's obviously always sad when when someone passes away and and especially someone that age but uh again there there was some good to him he wasn't a, it's not like he's the devil sitting down there like just counting his pennies or whatever. I, 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 he was, seemed like a very nice guy outside of the baseball suite, front office, whatever you want to say it. But uh, again, not the greatest owner, but seemed like a pretty decent human, all things considered. So I thought that story was pretty neat. I think sure. people at times, especially in this area, because it's natural, because they were the two legacy teams that have been here since just forever. But people at times would compare him to Dan Snyder. And that was just, mm -hmm. that was just just wildly unfair that, that was just yeah. such a dramatic over just come on come on guys so in that sense better than dan snyder <laughs> also checker spot brewing did you see they pulled the beer that they were doing what was that beer? was quite uh quite a little nugget to pull out of all of that's gone on in the last week that Checker Spot had, I think, Adios Angelos, a Mexican style lager, <laughs> and changed the name of that after he did unfortunately pass away. Wait, so. But I'll say, everybody and their mother knows that was not a shot at Peter Angelos. Somebody, but somebody would Angelos. have made it that it, oh, oh it's yeah. inappropriate. And honestly, I would, Peter Angelos is a much different individual for myself, but if there was an Adios Spencer beer when I passed, that'd be pretty cool. I think that'd be pretty neat. So, even if it was in that sense, maybe not in an evil sense, but maybe a more positive one. If it was we like will rim, we will rim the glass with your ashes, and we'll have it called Nadio Spenny. That was beautiful, Eric. That was somewhat Spenora. beautiful, somewhat hey. dark, dark. That was my beautiful dark twisted fantasy realized uh, very easily in the, the alcoholic version. So love that. Uh, with that segue, and just my own two cents. Angelos used to be a big spender, right? Came in, kind of rejuvenated Baltimore at one point, and it f really feels like. He was a millionaire that the game passed him by and became a billionaire sport. Um, hmm. You know, went from being a really wealthy owner early on to kind of not so much anymore. So the game kind of passed him on in ways. Bobby Abreu's story was cool. Re Abreu obviously goes on to have a bunch of cool years uh, there. So, yeah. And with that, Peter Angelos, rest in peace. I think we can segue there. Well, we can circle back if needed. But with that in mind, David Rubenstein and – that ownership group set to receive final vote on Wednesday, the night before opening day, and could get that approval, I guess, theoretically intact right before opening day, early on Thursday. Eric? 3, 3, p, 3 p.m. on Wednesday. 3 p.m. on Wednesday. So that could come down and approve leading right in to opening day there. So tons and tons and tons coming down the pipe. With that in mind, any other thoughts, anything, feel free to jump in. But wanted to kind of hop in here and just do a little bit of a breakdown. The Orioles haven't really released an official roster yet. There could be moves uh, tomorrow and Wednesday ahead, trades, releases, what this, that, and the other. But kind of wanted to do a little bit of a breakdown here of what the opening day situations are looking like. So with that, I'm going to pull up a little graphic here. And what it looks like currently is... Something along these lines here. Uh, I can't pull up my preview here, but regardless, uh, looks like it's going to be Colton Kowser, Austin Hayes, Cedric Mullins, Anthony Santander in the outfield. Tyler Nevin as a utility player. Gunnar Henderson, Jordan Westberg, Ramon Urias, Ryan Mountcastle, Ryan O'Hearn there in the infield as long as, as well as Jorge Mateo. And then Adley Rushman uh, going with James McCann there to ultimately and let's see if i can just share my whole darn screen here you want me to just pull up you want me to just show on my phone there we go is this pulling up for us there oh we go so there's a full graphic of it uh initial breakdown again this is not finalized but looking at the outfield looking at the infield and looking at of course adley rushman and james mccann boys anything that stands out about this group is this presenting well by the way on the screen 
presenting very well. Perfect. So Eric, Eric, initial thoughts on this kind of opening day, so to speak, again, not finalized, but on this roster as things stand. I mean, I'll stay obvious. I, I think the, the, the one thing everyone was talking about is Jackson holiday, not making it. Um, we know what he did in spring training. Uh, the, 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 the home runs he hit the, you know, the grand slam off the division opponent. The, um, again, just, just how he carried himself. Uh, everything seemed to be trending in that direction that he was going to make it. Obviously he didn't. Um, and again, I, I threw, I threw the pissy fit on Twitter as, as a lot of people did. And I, I fully understand why he, didn't. I get it. I, I know he needs more, you know, more at first lefties. They, they want to get more playing time at second base. I get it. I didn't like it from a personal standpoint. I selfishly, I wanted him up running down the carpet, the orange carpet on opening day. I fully get it though. I, you know, I've, I had explained to me 45 different times. I get it. People. I don't think it was service time manipulation. I don't think it's like, Oh, we're going to keep him down 18 days and blah, blah, blah. Cause again, I, I've said it a billion times. I don't give a fuck about 2030. I care about 2024. Um, but it, again, I get it. Um, the optics of, of Tyler Nevin making it over, over Jackson. That's not really what it is. Cause the, you know, I saw people saying that, like, I can't believe they're going to give these at bats, not to Heston or not to uh, Stowers or, you know, not to Jackson. It's like, that's not what it is. Tyler Nevin is going to get, I think Spenny, you said it in the, in the group chat. Nevin is going to get five at bats a week. Maybe, you know, like it's not, they're not going to have Jackson come up and, and have him waste away on the bench while he, when he could be getting at bats in Norfolk. I hate it. I don't like it, but I get it. Um, and, and it, it, again, same thing with Stowers and Kerstad. Those guys need consistent at bats. They need to be up there getting, playing every day. So that's going to happen in Norfolk. Hopefully, we're going to see all these guys. Everyone knows the 20s. These aren't, they're going to have a roster move a week and a half into the season. Like this could, it's not set in stone. So, Got different guys are going to come up, but again, that's that's the big thing everyone is looking at. Everyone else seems to be about right. The outfielders, I think, cows are making it is great, good for him. He had some awesome quotes about making it. Um, I'm really happy for him. And again, same thing. Mateo is going to also be in the outfield, so he could be a fifth outfielder. It, it's a it's a fun roster. I mean, you look at those names. That's that's a very fun makeup of guys. Um, who who I mean, they they all have power. They they all have very high potential. And we could have some very fun. I, they could average like seven or eight runs a game, you know, for an extended stretch. All these guys can hit. So that, that's kind of my takeaway right now, just from the uh, positional players. But um, again, the big the big one is Jackson not making it and, and Tyler Nevin making it. Congrats to Tyler for making it. He's an awesome guy. Um, had a hell of a spring, too. So he earned it. It's not like he was hitting. He wasn't Nick Maton, who was batting zero. Like Nevin had a great, he had a great spring, too. So you have to reward him. So again, we'll see guys up. We'll see guys down no reason to real to really piss and moan now, now anymore about uh jackson again i i said my my piece i'm over it and uh and we're on to thursday and or friday brian how do you feel about what you see i mean just talent galore yeah i think i mean it was always it was the biggest headline of the entire spring training i know i'm just gonna start to ramble on about the whole jackson holiday thing again there's a notion out there it's like oh yeah maybe he'll be up in may it's like no dude like i think that that's that dude's going to be up by April 15th at the latest. Like he's not going to be down at AAA long. Um, I just don't understand why it's more about the notion of um, you, you put a carrot out in front of a guy and you say, Hey, go out and earn it kid. And he goes and does exactly all the things he's supposed to do. And then you don't reward it. I just don't feel like that sends the right message. And that's the sense of it that I think everybody's kind of following here. So um, not really an original thought, but I think there's something to be said about that. But um I don't know. There's just so much clay to play with here. Like there's so many guys that can play so many different positions. This isn't, you know, that 2012 to 2016 era Orioles where it's like, here, like JJ Hardy, you're going to lock him into shortstop. And like, I don't like, there's so much matchups with lefties, righties, um, interchangeable parts, but they all bring something different to the table. Um, there's just a bunch of dudes, just guys being dudes, just a great, great lineup where um gosh if you put you give certain guys rest on a given day like you're just not going to have a, a gigantic exposed hole in your lineup um we're going to see mccann in there but he performed in spots as needed last year um i don't know like and there's so many guys here too that um gosh like 
if even if they regress or or they could take a big step forward, like I we we shouldn't really expect O'Hearn to to repeat the performance last year. We hope, and we like a watered down version of last year is still a pretty damn good ball player. Um, but also we had the streaks, the ups and downs of Mateo last year. If you put him in a spot, I mean, hell, he's he's the one guy who seemed to hit in the Texas series last year. Like he could get off to a torrid start or he could perform in a big way. Like Kowser is a big, like if he just keeps doing what he's doing, like we're off and running. Like that's just like one, there's all kinds of like cherries on top to what we already know we're going to get from some guys. Like, like Gunner is going to be, I mean, I'm, I'm pegging in for MVP candidate type season. And we know what we get from Adley. The guy just gets on base like no other. Um, it's just, man, there's just so much to like here. And, and I, like Cedric Mullins, just to see how he bounces back from a tough series and a tough late September last year. Like, I don't know. There's a lot to keep an eye on. Certainly a nice mix of veterans there in the outfield. You have Hayes, you have Mullins, you have Santander, uh, Mount Castle and O'Hearn. O'Hearn, maybe not the most experienced player in the world, but he's been around for a while. He has experience in the minors. He's bounced around teams. You get that veteran presence from him. McCann there to settle things. Uh, outfield curious. You know, you look at DH possibilities. You're looking at Kowser. You're looking at Santander, McCann, or excuse me, uh, O'Hearn uh, in the mix there to, to really DH. And what I find is so interesting and what I think is really the most interesting part of the entire Orioles in 2024 roster construction in mind is that look at like Westberg, Westberg, Rias, like – Clearly, Gunnar Henderson has locked in at shortstop. Brandon Hyde's comments are that they plan on sticking him there and, and letting him rock and roll there for 2024. I think there was a quote that came out of Brandon Hyde at one point when asked about the shortstop position, like, hey, have fun going and telling Gunnar Henderson he's not going to play shortstop. And again, as mm-hmm. soft-spoken and kind and uh, gentle of a Southern boy, he appears outside of those white lines. Dude's an absolute psycho between them. So he wants to show his stuff there. Uh, I think that I've gotten into some conversations. Do people think that's for the best of the team and things so on and so forth? It's just a good problem to have. I mean, look at Joey Ortiz who broke the major league roster is expected to, I believe in Milwaukee. Again, this, this big puzzle of the infield with still Westberg. And then you talk about Kobe Mayo, look at Connor Norby down there, man. I mean, <laughs> mm-hmm. he might be just like Joey Ortiz. He Norby very well might've broken five to 10 big league rosters. Who knows? He's been in the minors for a while. He's done nothing but prove himself. Feels like a consistent uh, defensive piece that excelled in college, has excelled through the minors defensively and steady there. So this infield puzzle is really interesting to me. I think the outfield is fun and is going to be a mix of fun, whereas the infield is still going to be tinkering, and I think that is worrisome. Uh, Westberg, Arias, and Mateo all possibly platooning second base, depending on splits, things of that nature, uh, with Gunnar Henderson there. So... Uh, you know, continuity is very important defensively, it feels like, in the middle infield. But going to be a, a hodgepodge in senses. I think a big part of that Jackson Holiday conversation is the fact that the Orioles are about to play a million lefties in a row to start the year. They're about to play an unbelievable amount. Of, I, th- I, th- what, I don't know if you, have Eric, have like the idea of it. I think, what is it, like 10 of the first like 19 starts or something like that? I, I can't remember exactly what it is, but a really yeah. big stretch there of lefties. So, I don't remember. I, I don't. I don't have it off the top of my head. But yeah, it, and I know it is something like that. And again, I think John Mioli was on Glenn Clark. I think today, and he was like, "Listen, I, I get that you want Jackson to go down and, and get his at bats versus lefties, but he's like, do we know what is Durham starting lefties? Like, uh, you know, what if the, what if what if Durham throws out three righties? And he said at least if he started in the big leagues, at least again he's facing high leverage. You know." Uh, MLB caliber starting lefties, which again is like you want to you kind of want to see what you have there. So I, I understand that. Um, and I, I was talking with somebody else and they they had a great point with this too. Jackson goes down. He's going to face the pissed off, um, you know, six starters. You know, they would have been five, but, you know, there's six guys, guys who had been DFA, guys who are, you know, fighting and scratch and get back to the big league level. So they're and, – and, Jackson Holiday is going to have a target on his back all year. Triple A, double A, single A, major leagues, it doesn't matter. People are going to want to embarrass him. So they were like, these at-bats could get very intense against Jackson. Again, with these guys in triple A, if he's facing lefties and stuff like that. But with guys who are really, really trying to make their mark and show teams, look, 
I can do this. Let let me let me you know. Here's my best shot. And Jackson Jackson's the headliner. He's the headliner of yeah. the minors yeah. wherever you are. Hundred percent, hundred percent. And Brian and, Brian, you had the great the great point about the carrot on the string with Jackson and Elias. I and I, I'm with you there. That was the only part I don't like. If Elias in December doesn't say he has a strong possibility of making the team, and then he goes out and hits 330 with a grand slam, another home run, and an OPS of almost you know 950, then it's like, well, why'd you say it is strong possibility? And it is interesting because, like we we talked about, but the things that he needs help on, they're things that he can't improve himself. You know, he's a he needs to face more lefties. All right. It's not like they're like the strikeouts. Yes. People, people were really harping on the strikeouts. Five of his, what, 15 strikeouts came in the first three games. I think he had 11 over his next or 10 strikeouts over his next 11 games. But it, again, it's a lot of stuff. Regardless, throw the Jackson stuff away. Spenny, you're right. The outfield, I think is pretty set. I think it's Kowser and right field on opening day, Santander DH. And then again, you can kind of play with it around from there. And, uh, and then, and then, like you said, the, the infield is kind of, this guy here this day, but he'll be there tomorrow. And then that guy's going to be here and everyone's, it's going to be kind of rotating around gunner. And now we're going to have the people crying about a punt lineup when it's like Westberg or um, Westberg at third, Mateo at short, Ramon at second. And it's just like, Oh, fucking punt lineup. Good, great, great job, Hyde. So again, that's not a bad punt lineup. Uh, if you're, uh, if you're asking me, so. McCann behind the dish there too. The one thing I'll say on the holiday conversation too, in, in that vein of triple a is that, it does feel, and it's hard to quantify this. There are people that are smarter in baseball analytics than me, of course, but mm-hmm. I feel like quality lefties aren't in AAA. Lefties are a rare commodity that is highly valued, and if you are a consistent, dangerous lefty with stuff, you're in an MLB bullpen. Like It's hard to get those reps, so that part is a little uh, nonsensical in some regards, but not to take away, I mean, who are the headliners here, guys? It is Adley Rushman. It is Gunner. And I mean, I personally feel we'll get into it, but Westberg or Kowser, I think is going to add themselves into that sort of stratosphere. And then having the first base platoon of Mount Castle and O'Hearn, that's a dangerous combined hitter. If to Brian's point, maybe O'Hearn isn't able to do exactly what he did last year. It would be impractical to expect that result, but still should be a really rock solid platoon at first base there. So uh, there's power throughout with Santander. Mullins has showed power at times. Of course, Gunner, of course, Westberg. Uh, Rushman, Mountcastle, all these guys. So there's power, there's athleticism, there's base stealing ability. Uh, there's guys that can, you know, there's switch hitters all over. There's guys that can bat on the left side of the plate in that short porch. So a lot of versatility. They're going to play the splits. I think that is a part of the holiday conversation too, but a lot of fun there. Um, any, any rounding thoughts here before we switch to the pitchers? Austin Hayes made the all-star you- team last year. <laughs> he, he certainly did. Didn't even really touch on him at all. <laughs> Right, he's an afterthought as somebody who realistically is like a 270 20 home run hitter. Yep. Mm. I think that's um, an interesting way to put it for sure. Mullins in that my, same my regard, right? Name. Mullins is around there 250 270 20 dingers, 30 I think his uh stolen base total we'll get to some over unders and fun stuff about 27 and a half for stolen bases for Seti there. He, who do you think leads off? He Well, Mullins would make the All-Star team before he got hurt last year too. Like there's a legit chance they had two guys starting the All-Star game. So again, people People forget that. So, yeah. Realistically, even aside from Kowser, you're looking at two kind of all star ish caliber outfielders and then a 30 home run right fielder DH right there. And those are, those guys again are not getting any, any burn to, to Brian's point there, uh, ultimately. So, a uh, diverse lineup, man. They've got speed in different parts and, and it's going to be exciting to see how Adley and Gunner take that next step. And I imagine. Who knows is is at the top of the order, but I imagine those guys start to settle in at the two and the three spot or something like that next to each other to kind of protect each other. I would think at some point here. So um, mm-hmm. we can come back. Any other thoughts? We'll we'll, we'll go back to this. Ultimately, going to hop into our uh, as you guys are seeing Inception for a brief moment here. Going to hop into our our pitchers there. Uh, we'll get into some of these comments in a moment here as well. But we'll we'll hop into the pitchers. Have a ton of concurrent viewers on right now. So. Would love if you could watch on YouTube. Would love if you could go like and subscribe. We are just short of 2,000 subscribers. We would love for you to go get us there. Uh, if people who are watching, go and do that. Obviously, some of you already have done it, but if you have not, you can probably go get us there. During this episode, that would be fantastic. We appreciate you guys. Leave five-star reviews wherever you can. All that good stuff to support the boys. And hey, 
Thanks again to our presenting sponsor, Jimmy Seafood. Come catch us if you're tuning in a little bit late this Thursday or maybe Friday, opening day, whenever it is, we will be at the tailgoat with Jimmy's Famous here. So with that in mind, let's hop over into the pitchers a little bit and take a look see Lou at the rotation as things are set to pop out here. As we might see Inception for one quick second here. And then you're going to be able to go see opening day pitchers. I believe I, I might have put this slightly out of order here. Corbin Burns is going to be the opening day starter, the big ticket item. And I feel like it has kind of gone under the radar. Like it was talked about a lot, but I don't think you can truly get into the impact he makes. Grayson Rodriguez set to take the start in the second game of the opening day, uh, or excuse me, opening series uh, against the Angels there. I believe it is then Wells, then Kramer, then Irvin, if I'm not mistaken. So a little bit out of order on this graphic. Then coming out of the bullpen, kind of in alphabetical order there from Aiken to Webb, Bauman, Cano, Coulomb. Craig Kimbrell coming back, coming in to replace effectively that role as the closer for uh, Felix Bautista, unfortunately won't be able to. Not a bad replacement to bring in off a of free agency. How much does the Magna Carta cost? 1.3 Craig, Craig Kimbrels. CNL Perez, Dylan Tate making his return. And I have a couple guys listed as a catcher here by accident, but uh, Jacob Webb as well, which is a little bit of a controversial one there. So fellas, initial thoughts on this rotation, obviously not pictured here. Kyle Bradish and John Means, who I believe the comments from Michael Elias were that they are going to be able to, they're expecting them to join the lineup or join the rotation in the first half of the first half or something like that. Early on in the first half of the year. First quartile of the season. What was it? The first quartile of the season. The first quartile of the season. So to me, I would set that, uh, if, if I'm trying to go through coach speak or GM speak, I'd say that sounds like June, June-ish. I'll say June 15th is what it sounds like they're uh, expecting those guys to rejoin here. But guys, obviously Burns and G-Rod, excited to see what he can do in year two. But initial thoughts on this rotation as things stand for opening day and this bullpen. Eric, I'll go to you. The And Brian has talked about it before, but just the the amount of stuff that these guys have, like, again, Brian said it, He's like, I have, I can't remember a time where they, where they've just had guys with stuff like this, like just gross stuff. We already knew about Grayson. And then it's like, oh yeah, just add in Corbin Burns, who we, like, like we talked about before, um, has already won a Cy Young. He's the odds on favor to win the Cy Young in the AL plus 800 last time I saw. Um, again, yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a pitching staff that we've never really seen in Baltimore. Not, not anyone like that, you know, our age, anyone listening to the podcast, anyone who's able to get on and watch it has not seen a, a rotation like this. I mean, if, if Bradish was a hundred percent healthy and, and didn't have any sort of, you know, thing with his elbow, the, the starting three, I mean, your one, two, three of Burns, Bradish, Grayson is the best in baseball. I don't, I don't care what other team, I don't care who you want to throw against it. They're not better than those three. Um, again, Bradish being out for the first half of the quartile of the lunar year sucks. But again, if I still don't think he'll pitch at all. I think if it's 0.5 pitches, I'm taking the under. Um, that's just me. You know, me always a glass half full guy, but um, Burns and gray rod up top is that's that, that gets it moving that, that, that gets the blood flowing. They're like, and again, for years we were just like all all we want is like a horse a guy who will go out there every fifth day and stand on the mound with the like fuck you attitude like i'm gonna throw my best and there's not really much you can do about it we have two of those guys now there's two and both of them seem like alphas grayson flew under the radar this um spring training too he was awesome like his last start um the other day was great he seems like someone who is as dialed in as ever Again, Corbin Burns, what else do you have to say? He's a pro's pro, and he's here to win in a contract year. So sign me up for that, please. And then again, I mean, we could do a lot worse than Dean Kramer. We had a really good year last year, especially from like the end of the All-Star break on. He was incredible down the stretch. Tyler Wells, we know what he did in the first half. All he did was lead baseball and whip before he kind of got that that tired arm, dead arm, whatever you want to call it. But he came back, you know, at the the, the end of the season and was good. And then Cole Irvin, I think I think he can be a, a nice a nice lefty piece to the rotation. Uh, he started out spring strong. He kind of struggled late, but again, I'm not I'm not necessarily worried. He's just a guy who who is it was is working on stuff like everybody else is. 
So I, I do like the rotation a lot. I still would like another arm, um, whether it's a John Means coming back and, and you know, maybe it's Kyle Bradish, but I, I like how it's set up for now. The bullpen, again, I would love another arm. We got Danny Coulomb, you know, like this time last year, like two days before the opening day. Um, so again, things, I'm sure they're working the waiver wire. I'm sure they're looking at guys who are going to be DFA'd yet or, you know, a trade, something like that. But um Aiken had a strong spring. Say what you want about him. He had a strong spring. Bauman was out of options. I thought he was always going to make it. Um, again, Cano, we know what he can do. He got tired last year, and we saw his arm slot drop, and Big Ben called that out immediately. Um, but again, I mean, I, I'm excited for Kimbrell. I'm excited for Perez, for Tate, um, all those guys. So I think there's still work to be done. I wouldn't be shocked if another move is made. But again, just like the the, the position roster – these guys are going to come up and down like they're they're chase McDermott is, is scratching and clawing to get up here. Cade Povich, you know, that's a guy that, that we'll probably see in the bullpen at some point this season, if not the rotation. But again, if, if there's one part that worries me, it's the bullpen, but I also fully trust Michael eyes and Brandon Hyde to go like this, kind of close their eyes and just pick someone to be like, this guy's going to be our next stud out of the bullpen because they've done it the last like four or five years with Perez and and Cano and uh, Bautista and Jorge Lopez to a degree and all guys like that. So, you know, Danny Coulomb, guys like that. They they can find guys. So I'm 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 a little nervous about Penn. I think it'll 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 round out into form pretty soon. But rotation is is sexy. The top of that rotation is is absolutely sexy. So that that really gets me going. Brian, the Orioles go out and acquire Corbin Burns, which has not happened. No move like that has been made by the Baltimore Fighting Orioles in our lifetime here. How do you think Corbin Burns is going to impact guys like G-Rod, Kramer, Wells, uh, ultimately Bradish hopefully means there, having someone that has been there, has done that, uh, is currently the AL Cy Young favorite, which I didn't realize. We'll get into some odds later, but plus 800, uh, just ahead of Kevin Gosman. What do you think Burns' impact is, not just what he's doing on the bump every five days, but for this team, this organization, and especially some of these younger pitchers that haven't had that dude in the clubhouse, so to speak, that is this talented? It's probably a matter of how to conduct yourself from start to start, how to be consistent over the course of 162 games. I mean, we saw the way that Grayson seems to have this trajectory, or at least at the major league level, of two steps forward, one back, two steps forward, one back. And he made great, great, great strides after he got called up after the rough start last year. But <clears throat> I'm interested to see, and and to some degree, you don't really see kind of the outcome of this. But, I mean, he got roughed up pretty good last time we saw him, which was pretty disappointing because that was kind of like, this is the environment he should thrive in. Game two, already lost game one at home in our barn. Like, go out, go out. You were born for this, Grayson, you know? <clears throat> and it didn't go his way. And um, it's a shame that we didn't give him the opportunity to go out a second time in that postseason and kind of right some wrongs or, or just kind of get back on the horse. Um, so I'm interested to see what kind of Grayson comes out. Uh, is it going to be the second half Grayson? Is it going to be the one that we saw in one single, I don't know, Sunday in, in uh, October? It's probably going to be the first one. It's probably going to be the guy who shoved um but is he going to maintain is he going to be consistent um is he going to shake off the bad start and keep pushing forward by all means i think he would but i think having a guy like corbin burns there um to almost compete with him right to kind of show him an, an example the day before um i think it's nothing but a good thing and it goes for the rest of the rotation too. Like it just just elevates everybody else. It just raises the standard. Like I think <clears throat> there, there's Orioles fans were so content with pitchers who could pitch in the mid threes with ERA, and that was kind of like a, a high standard for us. And if if we could have guys go out and achieve that, it's like you've got a maid here in Baltimore. Kurt, like Burns is going to come in here shoving in the mid twos in ERA and. I think everybody's going to be trying to keep up with them, which is a great thing. I just think it's going to be one of those things where rising tide lifts all boats and, and it just makes everybody better. Should definitely take a lot of pressure off Grayson, right? He knows he doesn't have to be the number one superstar stud today and is such a young pitcher and can look at Burns who, you know, came up hot 
just the same way Grayson did as a, a highly heralded prospect by the time he got to the majors and was able to show his stuff a little bit. So should certainly take some pressure off there. Uh, really excited to see Dylan Tate here. Would be remiss to talk about, uh, not to talk about how talented he was and how kind of devastating that injury was last year, right? Imagine, obviously Felix Bautista not here, but imagine having Dylan Tate in last year's bullpen, healthy and knowing what he's capable of there. So I think that, like you said, Brian, this is, you know, a place where you, or I think Eric, actually, you expect the Orioles to make tons of adjustments, but they got some veteran guys in here. I mean, Coulomb, man, uh, has been there, done that a little bit. Aiken's been around. Ballman's gotten some experience. Cano, an all-star. Perez has hit some highs and some lows at this point. So a uh, pretty veteran group overall for the most part here. Uh, Jacob Webb, a little bit of an X factor there. Someone that definitely, I feel like, has the most pressure of anyone in this bullpen to not suck quickly and be able to keep his composure and, and get it done. Uh, might be that final guy there. So really fired up for this. And the way I'm looking at it, I mean, G-Rod's got his spot. He's on the opening day roster. He turned it on last year. He added that two seam reportedly this off season. He's been toying with that through spring training to, uh, to give something to go the other way. So I'm looking at Burns. I'm looking at G-Rod and those final three spots. I feel like Eric are a competition with Bradish and with uh, means on the way. And you mentioned, we mentioned Tyler Wells burnout, Cole Irvin, uh, does have an uptick in the velocity a little bit. I think Dean obviously has a huge lead on those guys, maybe even being that third guy. So maybe it's really between Wells and Irvin to prove which one at least should be able to stick around or at least put a really strong decision on Elias and Hyde ultimately as those guys get healthy. How do you feel about Kramer, Wells, Irvin, and really Wells and Irvin there, Eric? To me, it's it's Wells and Irvin. I, I think Kramer is in kind of a class by by himself. Um, I because again, I mean, when when we had Means and Bradish healthy, you know, on January fifteenth or whatever, um, those were the two guys that were in the bullpen. And I think everyone was like, "Yeah, that's fine." And like, oh, it's good because again, if there's an injury, one of them can step up. Boom, there's two injuries. Both of them are stepping up now. Um, but yeah, I, they they just both seem better suited i think tyler wells especially because we've also seen him in the closer role we've seen him in a setup role like we he's kind of done it all now in his short time here it's crazy um and same thing i mean irvin came out of the pen last year he could be a perfect long long guy if they need him to but kramer just kramer's a guy that like seems to kind of if he struggles it's early you know he'll give up a, a bloop in the first and then he'll give up a home run in the second and walk a guy had awful you know, splits in the first it. inning last year and then would always turn it on you know in the especially and then, second and third time through if yep, you could get exactly it. so he seems to settle down and and again that's why in the bullpen you don't really have time to settle down if you're coming in if you're a guy like Kramer who's coming in you know if he's a long relief guy you've already given up four in an inning and a third so it's like you don't really you kind of have to stop the bleeding now. You can't really say, all right, well, we'll get there in a minute. So Kramer, to me, that's why he seems like the better rotation piece. Um, and again, just how, I mean, he he was a bulldog down the stretch last year. If you go and look at those numbers. Um, so again, he was a big reason how, why they ended up winning 101 games and, and getting that, you know, that number one spot in the uh, the bye. But I think Wells and, and Irving in the bullpen um, makes a ton of sense over, over Kramer. Um, so that, that's, that's how I would lean. And, and you're hundred percent right about Tate. I'm, I'm completely forgot to mention him earlier. He threw like 70 innings in 2022. He was awesome. If he would have been there last, I mean, the bullpen last year was incredible. You add him. He, I mean, again, top former top five pick, I believe. Um, the guy's got it. He's talented. He was throwing a hundred this year too. At a, he did one of those, um, what was the training place he did? I forget it. Um, but they were putting num you know, videos of him throwing a hundred and we've seen his stuff dance all around. He'll be on pitching Ninja a bunch. I think he is, he's going to be some of my answers later when we do our, our predictions and stuff, but he is a huge piece to, uh, to the bullpen and the team, just the success and, and how they go. Really well said there, Brian, any other thoughts on this group of pitchers, question marks, positivities, areas you're, you're curious as, Curious too, as the season comes to an open here this Thursday or Friday. I'm excited to see the bullpen who's just going to emerge. It may not be anybody on the page that we looked at. I just, that's always a fun thing to see who can even make their mark where they're getting the seventh or eighth inning by mid May. Cause it just happens every year. Like Eric said, definitely going to be competitive there. Tons of room, tons of guys chomping for the bit. I think of guys like Vespi down in AAA that have been waiting for that opportunity for quite some time. A lefty that's shown good control and, uh, we just, we all, the exit 52 is a very Nick Vespi positive podcast, really nice guy, 
feel like he uh, hasn't gotten the best beat over the the last couple of years here, but hoping hoping to see the Vespi, Vespa scoot through Baltimore again. Uh, with that in mind, wanted to go through some of the segments like you mentioned here. Uh, player accolades. First one, which is quite appropriate for who we were just talking about. I think this might be your pick even, Eric, unless you had someone else in mind. Comeback player of the year in 2024 for the Baltimore Orioles. Someone that you think had a rough go or fought through injury as they return. And who do you think that will be in 2024? Yeah, it's it's Dylan Tate for me. Um, he's really, I mean, I think, I mean, he, he was the one that jumped out to me immediately. I've been horny for Dylan Tate for quite a while now this offseason. Just like seeing the videos of him working out and just thinking of him and an eighth inning guy, you know, seventh inning guy, getting him to Kimbrell, getting him to, to Cano. Um, it, it's not, I, I wish I could say it was as good. It's not as good at, as the Brock O'Day Britain bullpen. But again, he is an awesome bridge guy if he's healthy. Um, just to be able to get you four outs, you know, he can come in in, this, in the, the seventh and get an out. You know, and then, and then pitch the eighth if you need, or coming in the sixth and getting out or two, and then you know pitch his way into the seventh. But I, it's to me, it's Dylan Tate. That's I think he's five. He's far and away. If if the Orioles are winning 101 games again, Dylan Tate is having a massive year, like a a 1.98 ERA, you know, a, a WHIP under one, and and he's just he's filthy. And like I said, he's all over pitching ninja. So sign me up for uh for Dylan Tate comeback player of the year. Love it. I think that's a popular pick. Brian, who are you looking to for somebody to redeem themselves in one way or another for the Orioles in 2024? Can I can I say Colton Kowser? Like he wasn't really established as a big leaguer, but yeah. his initial debut was such a flop that like I think redemption is already on the way. I think any questions that were kind of out there were mostly answered by spring training, but of course it's never really cemented until you do it um in real games at the big league level and i think he's going to do it in a big way 100 percent. and cows are a good referendum on what can maybe happen when you don't get consistent at bats as you try to make that leap i was going to go with cows as well someone that i don't know i, I one time i saw christian yelich comp to him and i can't get it out of my mind just the mm -hmm. ability to reach the ball all over to sneakily drive the ball uh sneaky athletic i know that hyde said he improved defensively to the point where he trusts him. And I feel like we didn't see the same sort of confidence in the majors, even defensively at one point that Kowser did have in the minors there. So a uh, guy that did get sent down did absolutely rip once he got sent down after that tough stint where, uh, I mean, at times it was awful. It was, it was a joke at one point, how, how little confidence he had and how blind he was in terms of timing and really just swinging kind of blindly there. We saw it with, with Kyle Stowers too, who's looking to get some redemption here at some point. Uh, that had an awesome spring training too. So I love those picks ultimately. Uh, definitely think, you know, maybe a Tyler Wells is a sneaky guy who probably feels pretty pissed off about mm -hmm. running out of gas, right? He was so damn good, was getting kind of borderline Cy Young consideration at one point, just let up solo homers, nothing else. His changeup, one of the most devastating pitches in ba in baseball at one point there. So uh, Wells needed new knows, similar to Cano, who I think you mentioned, Eric. Hey, I can't run out of gas this year. I've got to work on my conditioning. I've got to get in the shape uh, with elasticity of my arm and everything to be able to maintain through. So uh, I think Wells is another really fun one. In terms of a player moving on to the next accolade here uh, that you think will be the, I was going to, we can do home run leader actually. Who do you think leads this squad in home runs? Brian, I'll start with you. We've been starting with Eric. Who do you think is uh, the, the slugger of, I don't know. This is, a, this is a sneaky year for it where it feels like there could be a couple different answers, but who do you got leading the Orioles in home runs this year, Brian? I think Gunner's going to put up a 40 plus piece. Ooh, yeah. I think he's gonna do it. Yeah. He's going to lose a good handful. Like, like, cause I mean, remember when he was coming up on the early side where like the hype train wasn't huge on Gunnar Henderson, but it was like, okay, high school kid. He's, he's balling out in low a and high a, like where was he hitting all his homers, Eric? He was he was uh, Oppo, right? Was he going Oppo? Oppo? Oppo tanks. He's he's a guy who's losing four or five bombs a year because of mm -hmm. the fence in left field, which you would think doesn't make any sense. But um, I think he's just going to be dumping balls on a flag court just all season. Hundred percent. I feel like he has tried to work himself into being a little bit more of a power pole hitter at times too, because of that. Uh, probably by design, and it might not even be his own idea there. Eric, who do you think absolutely slugs for the Orioles this year and leads them in home runs? 
I have senior taters hitting 38 home runs. I think Tony uh, is going to have a big year. He's in, it's, I, I believe, a walk year for him. Um, and again, we've all he's done the last couple of years is like, I think he's second in baseball, second or third in baseball in home runs by a uh, switch hitter over like, I think the last three or four years. Um, when he, when he gets hot, you want to talk about dumping balls onto the flag court. Nobody does it in like bunches. Like he does. He'll have, he'll go two and a half weeks without a home run. And then he'll hit eight and 10 games, you know, with two in a game, one and three, two and another one, zero, zero. And then he'll have three or something like that. But he, he seems to hit them in, in bunches and, and, I, I can see him get, sniffing up towards 40. I got him at 38 right now, but I, uh, and ex- again, especially if he's DHing, you know, more with Kowser in right field now or Bateo, you know, wherever you want to do it. If he's DHing more, obviously, you know, you think it's saving his legs, maybe it's giving him a little more rest and, and he can kind of, not that he, he doesn't miss time. He's been pretty, he's been pretty healthy. Um, I know he got hurt in 2020, but I, I, I think other than that, he's been pretty healthy. Um, so I could see him up around 40 home runs again, a, a late season push to push him over 40 would be great. Um, there was a, a, um, there was a prop bet on, on an unnamed betting website. I saw that was um, Adley Gunner and Santander over 30 home runs all. And I was like, Ooh, that, that could see, that could be fun. That could be a fun season long one. So yeah, I got it. I got him at 38. I think he leads. And uh, again, I think there's like a bunch of guys grouped together, 34, 35, 33. And then Santander just has like 38. So senior uh, Mr. Potato Head. I've got the combo of Gunner, Santander, and Adley Rushman on FanDuel to hit 30 plus home runs each at plus 2100 currently. So that's a fun little round robin you could go throw down on. And that's a fun one as well. That's some fun value there. Uh, I think Adley Rushman's will get to his over under is much lower, but uh, I'm going to go with Gunner as well. And I'm going to, uh, you know, just looks like a tank. Looks like he's filling out even more. And again, look into that pull power. I'm really curious to see what Ryan Mountcastle does this year. I think that he mm-hmm. is such a volatile player that has, that goes into, you mentioned Tony who the ball turns into a beach ball for Tony uh, taters there. I think Ryan Mountcastle, the ball turns into like, I, I don't even know an asteroid that he can just whack with like the, Thor's hammer there. So curious to see what he does. Looking for him to string something consistent together. Obviously, him and O'Hearn looked at platoon a good bit. Uh, Lefty righty splits there. So interesting, interesting, interesting all around. But yeah, go check that out. 2100. Just a fun little sprinkle. Just put a little chicken McNugget uh, combo. Five bucks, 524 on those three to hit 30 home runs. It's a fun little bet there. Who do you think is the X factor for this team in terms of really just providing that spark that they need to get to the next level? Brian, I'll start with you again. It's hmm, a good question. Dark horse, another word we can use, X factor, player that you think just the Orioles need in or, to have a stellar performance that maybe is a little quieter in order to accomplish their goals and get close to or exceed what they did in 2023. This might be a bit of a left field one, but like Dean Kramer. Like, I feel like you can expect what you're going to get from those first two guys, but you get that third guy, or at least in the rotation, to start things off. And he's a guy who you know is going to be in the rotation the full year, provided he's healthy. So um, his starts, everybody's starts in the rotation matter the same, you know? Like, you're as good as your worst pitcher and as good as your best pitcher, you know? So... You need your back end to perform, maybe not as well as the top end, but I mean, um, we, we saw Garrett Cole and the Yankees last year be absolutely unbelievable, and the rest of their rotation stinks, and it you know tanked their season. Yeah, I I think something that we maybe overlooked with the 2014 Orioles is that we had five guys who were all like number two starters, maybe tweeners of two three starters, but there was no weak link. Like there was no guy who the other team was licking their chops against. And if we can just kind of repeat that, especially in the middle of the rotation, I think that would be huge. So I like Dean Kramer. Um, If he can just be like a 3.75 ERA guy, that's massive for this team. Quality starts with four and a half there. So three, seven would would definitely get it done. Eric, who are you looking at as somebody that's going to electrify this team uh, and for them to accomplish those goals ultimately is the X factor. 
I, I was going to go Kramer. That That's who had jumped to my mind pretty much for the exact same reason uh, Brian said. Um, but I will, I will pivot. And again, it's not, this guy isn't a dark horse. Again, we saw him make Orioles history a couple years ago, but it's Cedric Mullins to me. I mean, when he is, when he's on and going, he's one of the best center fielders in baseball. Um, I've said it a billion times about him. He's the straw that stirs the drink. You know, if he can get on, if he's leading off and again, I mean, he, he had a really, really bad stretch after he got hurt and a groin injury, a hamstring injury that sucks. And it's, 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 it's never going to heal right. Especially for a speedy guy like him. Um, who again, steals bases. He, he hits home runs. He can do it all. I think his approach has to get better at the plate. Um, if he's leading off, he can't be hitting, he can't be doing the numbers that he was. Um, you got to look to walk a little more. And again, he had some flat out gross at bats towards the end of the year. And and he was kind of a black, not a black hole, but he was, it was tough to watch him in some situations. He seemed to just be popping up the second and he was, he was doing a lot of popping up and striking out with a long kind of swing. It, it got gross. But again, if he's on and can stay healthy, I mean, we know what he does on defense. It's, he's a gold glove caliber center fielder. I don't know how he didn't win it last year. I mean, we, we saw him single-handedly win them a game in Seattle last year. Um, you know, robbing a home run, hitting a home run, yada, yada, yada. But I think if he is on and 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 healthy, and if he's at the top of the lineup hitting, the, the team is just, they're a well-oiled machine with it. I like, I always think I'm like, man, if you can get him on, he steals second, then you got Adley up. And so you got the pitcher going, all right, I got this guy's on second. He's super fast. I got Adley behind him. Oh, by the way, I got Adley at the plate. Oh, by the way, Gunnar Henderson's on deck. Oh, by the way, Anthony Santander is in the hole. Oh, by the way, you know, Ryan Mountcastle's behind him. It's like, you're just, your pitcher's already fucked at that point. He's already thinking like, all right, how do I, what do I do? And then, you know, next thing you know, he's got a pitch clock violation and and blah, blah, blah. And now, and uh, Cedric's stealing, but I don't know. That's my, that's my fantasy. But yeah, Cedric is, uh, is my dark horse kind of straw that stirs the drink uh, pick. Huge shout out to Don C here in the chat. Go throw us those likes. We appreciate the the super chat there, Don. Uh, threw us one and said that prop bet oh, sounds cool. Brian, as long as Adley, Gunner, and Taters don't participate in that said prop bet, uh, don't need a, a little Michael Porter Jr. Uh, Shohei Otani drama going on there with those fellas. I, I think they'll be all right. I think they have enough little wagers between themselves in that clubhouse to get them going. Don, we appreciate it. Uh, I was going to go with Cedric Mullins as well. And I feel like this one is under an underrated pick because it's kind of obvious, but Grayson Rodriguez, man, for him to be able to get more efficient, go deeper into games, look to Corbin Burns, Brian, to your point, to become a more uh, professional, grown-up, mature pitcher quickly, being able to anything you can do, I can do better, that competition, all that stuff, uh, I think propels this team. If you have a one-two of Burns and what Rodriguez is capable of in terms of the stuff and him getting a little bit more efficient, being able to get quicker outs earlier in games and pitch to his defense a little bit. Uh, I think that that is scary. And you can look at Wells and Irvin as guys, especially really Irvin comes to mind, guys that maybe you expect shorter outings, you prepare for it. But if G-Rod can get up into the six, seven inning range somewhat consistently into that quality start range, I think that really propels this team and it'll save a bullpen that has a lot of question marks right now, but also has a lot of experience. So I think that's imperative early on. Uh, I do think that a huge part of that too is, is Grayson, high school pitcher, not a college pitcher guy, guy that didn't, I don't believe, play in any state title games or anything like that down in Texas. I don't think he was in super high leverage situations. I think we saw him get really frustrated last year, emotional, uh, kind of wore it on his sleeve a little bit, and would like to see him maybe keep it a little bit more. You know, I, I'm not telling guys not to, uh, you know, have fun with it or, or go full tilt. I love when Gunner does good or bad. I love when he try, wants to snap a knee over his bat. But to me, it felt like G-Rod would let himself get rattled and really struggled to rebound from it. So I'd love to see him just be a little bit more calm, cool, collected uh, when he does have those tough innings that the best pitchers in the history of the world have. You know, Shohei Otani, freaking Garrett Cole, everybody in baseball right now is going to have them. There's never been somebody who doesn't. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and look at G-Rod there as my X factor. Biggest trade candidate, Eric, who do you look at on this roster? Currently, knowing that there's so many prospects that are chomping at the bit, and hey, maybe if you even could be a prospect or a couple players you look at, Eric. Of course, this infield is super jammed. The outfield has possibilities too. I mean, Kerstead's down there. Who, who knows, man? So who do you look at on this roster and say, gosh, it, it doesn't make a ton of sense considering what the Orioles have in other places and someone they might trade uh, early or by the deadline? Again, I mean, there, there's 15 different answers here, it seems like. Um I, I'm going to go Ramon Urias. It, I mean, I think it has to be. 
Um, and again, it's wild because again, now we're in a spot where it's like, oh yeah, the guy won a gold glove two, two years ago and we don't have room for him. We just don't. He's not a starter on this ball club and he won't be, you know, he'll get his starts, but he's not, he's not going to start over Westberg. He's not going to, you know, eventually Jackson will be up. And I, I think, I think they move him. I think they package him with, you know, maybe it's a Sowers, maybe it's Ramon and Hayes for a pitcher or someone, you know, to create room. But I, I, I think Ramon is the guy for me. Again, he's, He's been awesome defensively. He's a good – last year was a down year offensively with a bat, but defensively he's about as good as it gets, and he can play third, and he can play second, he can play first. You know, I'm sure in a pinch if he needed to, he could play short. But he's he's a guy that I think they just – and he had a great spring too, which helps him a lot. They just don't have room for him, again, especially when Jackson comes up, which, again, could be tomorrow. It could be three – it could be three weeks. It could be three months. We don't know, but I, I think he's a prime candidate to get moved um, either by himself or with someone to to, again, just kind of open up a spot for uh, for Jackson and one of the other uh, one of the other young guys on the team. Brian, any thoughts on that? Anyone you're looking at? I mean, I think that's pretty head on and he, the way he coupled it with the outfield situation that we talked about it on, on one episode in particular, like just too many cooks it's a good problem to have but somebody's eventually going to have to go and um usually it tends to be the the slow horse in the race that gets shipped off and um for a team that's contending that's probably about right but um that's it, kind of a non-answer it's just a matter of, like who is going to be the weak link it's, in the infield it's probably urias like it's spot on in the outfield i think that story is yet to be told Obviously, Urias not you know doesn't have a bunch of years left, and I think it just makes sense for if I'm a team that wants a player, and I have an injury or I just have a hole at third base, Urias can come in and quiet things down, right? He can really just be an average hitter. We don't talk. I feel like he has underrated power that because that wall got pushed back so high has definitely dissipated a little bit and changed his approach. So uh, sending him somewhere with maybe a more average porch out there in left field. Uh, would be an advantage there. So it, it really is a messy situation. We're probably going to talk about that a thousand times as guys start to come up. Uh, and again, I, I don't know where, just to look in the organization, I don't know where Connor Norby finds playing time on this team. I don't know. It, it feels like he is just in similar territory to Joey Ortiz. So talking about maybe coupling those two guys to go find some bullpen help and diversify your prospects in terms of starting pitchers, maybe uh, something like that to just realign the sticks that you're played. Uh, rapid fire here a little bit, guys. Uh, biggest surprise player, biggest breakout player. We kind of already touched on that a little bit, but so surprise player, breakout player. Who who else comes to mind? Just rapid fire off the top of the heads. My my biggest breakout was going to be Westberg. I think he is going to um, capture the like the hearts of this fan base. I think he is a guy who um, is not. It feels like we just don't know that much about him. He seems kind of quiet and laid back, and he's not, he doesn't have the personality of an Adley or a Gunner or a Santander or any of those guys. But he just, and I've said it for a while now this offseason, he seems like a perfect buck guy. He can play all over, he can do whatever you need. Um, he just, he, he was born to hit baseballs very hard, and that's what he's going to do. Um, and, and when I interviewed Hollander on the show, Brett Hollander, he said, he said, he told a story and was like, Westberg may be the most intense guy on the field. And I was like, what? That doesn't, I don't remember seeing, you know, him have any gunner antics or anything. And he told the story about that, you know, they lost big um, the one night in San Diego. And he said they were down, you know, eight to one or something in the ninth inning. And Westberg grounds out. He was running hard out of the box, grounds out to, you know, to third or whatever and gets in the dugout. And they said he went to town on the Gatorade cooler. And he was like, he's just a psycho. Like that's, you know, and, but I, I was like, I didn't know that. I, you know, I feel like he's calling, he's kind of just, he seems calm, cool and collected and just kind of like, I'm just here to play baseball. But I, I feel like he's a guy who is going to hit, he could hit 280, 290, I think. And, and again, play him at second, play him at short, you know, play him at third. If you need to, I, I think he played corner outfield positions in Norfolk too. So not that they're going to need that, but he seems like a guy who will do anything he can to get on the baseball field and says, you know, Coach, just let me know what mitt to take out to the field, and I'll I'll go out there. And and he's just he's down for whatever on the diamond, and and I think he's going to be a really really good baseball player. He, Buck would have loved him. He's a perfect Mississippi State guy. Um, he's I I think he's very entertaining and electric. So I'm 
I'm on, I'm on the uh, the Westberg uh, hype train. It's funny you say that because the Orioles just teased their new uh, episode one of the next chapter. They teased on their their Twitter a little documentary series, and then there's a brief mm-hmm. little clip of that where Jordan Westberg, with no smile on his face, is saying, "I love the guys in this clubhouse, but I'm not trying to give anybody an inch here, basically." And uh, we got the Masters around the corner. We got you know the, the most beautiful stretch in golf, Amon Corner. I think that I'm going to start calling. Gunner and Westy when he's over there, aim in corner because you're going to need to say amen. Those guys will rip your head off. Those guys are fucking psychopaths. Like Jordan Westberg, I don't know how no one realized he's a psychopath. The fact that he's so weird, like so intense, I feel like reflects in his interviews. He looks like a looks and talks like a psycho, and that story makes a ton of sense to me. So uh, I, I love that, and I think that is going to be the most intense left infield in baseball. I think Westberg might settle over there at third once we see a holiday come up, for instance. So. Uh, mm-hmm. I think that those guys are going to have an unbelievable amount of competitiveness. I think that Westberg being an older prospect, Mississippi state pedigree, all those things is going to lead to a level of like, I feel like Gunner and Westberg are going to expect perfection in the infield. I feel like if Mateo is getting loosey goosey at second base or wherever he ends up, it is not going to be acceptable. I think those guys are, you know, Gunner's young. Westberg's not a young guy, but he's not an MLB experienced guy, but I, I love that. And I'm super excited to see just exactly how, like early nineties flip out gunner and West to get over there in the corner. Brian, who are you looking at as a bla- breakout player this year? Um, I'll go for another one where it's just, yeah, I know you said cows or you can get deeper into that or another one, anything. No, that no, in. I, I think, um, just I'll take a gamble here and just say some stars are going to line where, where Heston cursed dad's going to get an opportunity and he's going to come hot out of the gates and, and really cement himself and say, Hey, you need to give me at bats. And, uh, this ballpark fits my my profile, and I'm mm-hmm. gonna take the ball and run with it. Um, that's one I don't think anybody's talking about. I don't know that that's uh, an odds on good bet per se, but um, I don't think it would surprise anybody either. Definitely not. I, I think those are two great picks there. So I, I like Westberg too. Like I said, I think that another thing that sticks out to me about Westberg is that, like you said, Eric, he did get bounced around. And it didn't seem to impact him the way it impacted some of the other guys. The the limited at bats at times where we saw Kowser and Stowers kind of struggle. I think that's why Westberg was maybe the first of that next wave post, you know, Adley and Gunner, who obviously became, you know, number one prospects in baseball. But I, I love that pick as a breakout as well. Uh, other things we had here, All-Stars. Who do you guys think makes the All-Star team? Brian, I'll start with you. When we're looking back in, in July, who do you think notches that uh, that All-Star title? Gunner, Adley, Corbin Burns. I want to what do you got brewing in there? I would just want hey. to say Jackson Holiday. I would just want to say he's going to come up with <laughs> <and> just rake. <laughs> Jackson Holiday, sure, why not? It's wow. Crazy. I mean, is he going to be up early enough to do it? But Jackson Holiday. Oh. Love wow. it. Eric, Eric, what do, what do you think about that? What do you think about uh, that, that group there? Any, any additions? I, I like the group. I, I had Adley, Gunner, Corbin, Grayson, Santander. I, I think, I think they, they, they get a boatload of birds, a flock of birds, if you will, a flock of seagulls, one would say. Um, and I think Grayson those guys are head- where, where Kim- Kimbrel could get on there too, just by virtue of just filling it up on the statue. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where, do we know do we know where it is this year? Let's find out. We have the Google machine. Are they going to yeah. Toronto this year? No, no. That that'll be soon though. Um I think Arlington, Texas. It, I knew that. Yeah. I knew that. Down the there big, in Arlington. The warehouse, the hangar. The yeah. airplane hangar. I've seen that place. Pretty pretty cool looking um, from the outside. I, I'll say I'll say I'll say they get a uh, another home run guy too, another home run derby guy. I don't know who. I, I want to say Gunner, but that's kind of just too. Maybe Mountcastle. Mountie could be fun. Santander could be fun too. So I'll say they do have someone in the home run derby. I, I've always wanted to see Mountcastle in a home run derby. I feel like he could absolutely rip uh, his. Mm-hmm. I feel like he has stamina in his swing. I don't think his swing tires him that much as well. Yeah. Uh, I'm not crazy I'm toward there. I'm going to go with just three. I, I think that we see Adley as a starting catcher, Gunner as a starting shortstop, and Corbin Burns uh, is going to be a, a starting pitcher there. Uh, if if not, maybe the number one getter as again the the Cy Young favorite. So I'm gonna go with just three, and I think that'll uh, 
get everybody all riled up and pissed off and why isn't you know this guy that guy and that guy an all star too uh but threes you know not not too crazy in that regard so uh anything mm -hmm. else we have towards mvp of this team what is what comes to mind obviously you got goner you got adley corbin probably going to be the three the three choices there in some regard uh who do you think is the most valuable player ultimately when it's all said and done when we're looking back hopefully towards playoff time and Orioles looking at a hopeful AL East repeat. Who do you think is the MVP of this team, Brian? I think Gunnar Henderson is the MVP of the American League. I just think um, he's got a cock full of confidence after the way that the second half went for him, and he's just going to get after it. He's going to have the attitude. Um, he's got the sauce. Uh -huh. He's got the marketability. Dude, he's just he's just an animal. He's, he's like I, I call it 40 plus donks. 110 RBIs, probably 100 runs too. I mean, what do you have, like eight triples Great last year or something crazy? Yeah. He's an animal. Absolute animal. Eric, do you agree with that sentiment? Do you think he's the, the MVP of the Orioles, if not the league? I, I love cock full of confidence more than I've loved anything in a long time. That's a great saying. That is so good. Um, I also actually bet him to win um, MVP this weekend at plus 1,800. I'm going Adley, though. I think Adley wins the team MVP. I think I think um, the media is going to fall in love with the, like, the, the, the veteran – ace coming in and you know really helping out adley i you know corbin's gonna have great numbers and i think the media is really gonna eat up the like look at how much you know adley helps him he helps adley this relationship of a of an ace and the catcher like this is this is what you go through and this is why it means so much and stuff like that so i think the media is really gonna eat that up um and it's kind of one of those like gunner's the best player on the team i think adley's the most important um one of those kind of pft uh one of those uh P or sorry PMT kind of uh conversations. But yeah, I'll, I'll go I'll go Adley. Um and Brandon, that was cock full of confidence, trademarked by uh uh Banks. So that's uh shirts sure. shirts will be on sale. <laughs> shirts on the way. I'm gonna go Corbin Burns there. I think that having that established, been there, done that filth that just doesn't quit, does not tire is going to do things for this team in terms of value and in terms of legitimizing themselves, right? They're, he feels like the piece that makes this team not the scrappy up-and-comers that are ahead of schedule. We haven't seen a move like this, again, in our lives. I think that that curveball is something that the Orioles have not had, specifically a curveball, specifically a breaking pitch like that, that Adley Rushman is going to be able to use as a weapon. Corbin Burns is going to be able to use as a weapon and allows them to compete in the playoffs into a degree that wasn't possible without him. And again, I think the pressure it takes off of Grayson, the pressure it ends up taking off, and maybe Corbin Burns was pushed over the finish line, even though I, I genuinely think it was highway robbery for Joey Ortiz and DL Hall, uh, and that being it, to go get a Burns, even if it is just a one-year rental. But – that move takes pressure off of everything else in your rotation. It takes pressure off of Means. It takes pressure off of Bradish in their recoveries. Grayson, it allows Dean to settle into a middle-of-the-pack kind of, you know, rotational role. And again, I, mm -hmm. I think that, not that Burns isn't going to, you know, go 30 starts without getting dinged up once or twice, but just the reliability and consistency he's going to provide and the ability to just fucking strike guys the fuck out. He's the leader. I think he's second behind Spencer Strider to lead the major leagues in strikeouts as well. He's a certified ERA, ERA plus, breaking ball, backdoor cutter, savant that is going to pound through the AL East and be able to compete. With the AL East, it's probably pissed off at the Orioles, right? They're like, oh, last year was a fluke. Like, oh, the Yankees tail off. The Blue Jays licked their wounds a little bit. The Rays have had their troubles as the Red Sox try to rebuild themselves. But I think that move just legitimizes them so much in the division and as a true contender – and come playoff time, I think we look back at Corbin Burns as a piece that makes sure last year didn't doesn't happen again in that nervous, young energy that this team had going into that playoff series. And uh, I think it just brings so much confidence to the entire organization having someone like that at the top there. So uh, love those three. I mean, what what a like if this was like MLB Jam and you have Gunner Adley and Corbin Burns as you're like in some arcade game, like it doesn't get cooler than that. It doesn't get sicker than that. 
with where those guys are in their career. I think that is the coolest core of players in baseball right now. And they couldn't just fit Baltimore any better. So um, any, any other thoughts there as we kind of went through some accolades, things like that, we're going on a while here. We've got a little bit more, but uh, really want to make sure we open up the floor and say thank you to Jimmy Seafood. If you're still with us, go ahead and throw us a like, all that good stuff. Brian, Eric, any other thoughts as we kind of uh, get into the, the wind down here, go through some final predictions and things of that nature. I, I'm just getting more and more jacked up. Just thinking about it. Like, like you said, that last three, like, Oh yeah. Adley Gunner, Corbin Burns, like those three are all in the same baseball team for our favorite team at this time is just coming off last year. Like I'm, I remember that, that game three of the Texas series so vividly. And I remember it like literally like it was yesterday, just being like, man, like this, this bad taste is going to sit in my mouth all off season. And it did. And, and, and again, it's just, they've only improved on the field, off the field, in the warehouse, you know, on the, on the diamond. And I'm just, I'm so goddamn fired up for, for what's to come in 2024 for the Orioles. And, and I, I think this really truly is, is going to be a special year for the Orioles. I think it's going to be a great year for Baltimore. Um, it's just, it's, it's a perfect storm of things happening and, and combining. And and we're very lucky that uh, this is our favorite team. And just like Brian, you especially just like think of that sentence from the time that you, me, you and Taylor sat down and started the podcast being like, this is what we have to look forward to. This is, this is what we have, you know, on, on, this is what we're on the verge of. And it's just, it's awesome. I'm so excited. I'm not sure what the exact timing was, but I would imagine the Elias hire and the podcast start is at a pretty similar time. Elias may have been a smidge earlier. It was earlier. That was like but November. It, he, had, he had to 19. bottom it all out. So like the true deaths of the rebuild, like the basement of it was probably right when the podcast started. So. I think that's right. That's it's been a, it's been a hell of a ride here. And uh, it's, we arrived last year. It's just, it's great to be here. Speaking of which, throughout this season, we are planning on doing and aiming to do series recaps at the conclusion of every series. There'll still be the the flagship pod running and as breaking news happens, as call-ups happen, as exciting things happen, the boys are going to hop in the studio. But we figured that was the most fun way to uh, stay current and quick. And it's going to be a hodgepodge crew. It'll be a lot of Eric for sure. A lot of Brian for sure. I'll be down on those. Jake, Taylor, and myself. Uh, hopping through there as well. So take a, a look out for those as the season continues on. With that, wanted to hop into some odds and over-unders. Uh, the Orioles are plus 650, right about, depending on the book you look at, to win the AL. That is the third best odds tied with the Rangers or right around the Rangers there. The Orioles are plus 200 to win the AL East. The Yankees are plus 165. Blue Jays, plus 380. Rays, plus 500. Sox, plus 1,900. Again, the Orioles, plus 200 to win the AL East. Gunnar Henderson, I think maybe the like least kept secret, sneaky, quote unquote, sneaky MVP bet. He is plus 1,800 to win MVP mm -hmm. in the AL. That is tied for the seventh best odds. Adley Rushman plus 2,500, just a little bit down, a couple clicks down there. Corbin Burns, I was surprised to find, is the odds on favorite to win AL Cy Young. Plus 800, just ahead of former Baltimore Oriole Kevin Gosman. Jackson Holiday plus 470 to win AL Rookie of the Year behind a pair of Texas Rangers at plus 470, the third best odds there. So I uh, wanted to play a little bit of over under with you boys. We can go rapid fire, come back and look at it. I'm going to go Brian over or under 20 and a half home runs for Adley Rushman. Slightly over. Sounds like a 22, 23 guess for you. Yeah. I think you're, I think he's right there. Eric Gunnar Henderson over under 27 and a half home runs. We heard <laughs> Brian's 40 prediction. Eric's pumping it up, baby. Pump, pump, pump it up. A little Joe Budden in the house. Up. Tony Taters, Brian, over under 27 and a half ding dongs. We'll, uh, we'll mix in an under here. I, uh, you know, Oof. yeah. We'll just mix in a water. 20, We're mixing in a water right runs, there. Yeah. Eric, does Corbin Burns finish with over 200 strikeouts, which is his current line? Yes. 200, yes, 208 strikeouts. 208. 208 strikeouts for Corbin Burns. He is plus 1,200 to lead the MLB in strikeouts, which is the second best odds, of course, behind Spencer Strider. Brian, over under 172 and a half strikeouts for Grayson Rodriguez. Over. Yeah. I like the over, over there a lot, over. too. It's a hard over. 
Yeah. Through those odds, Eric, what do you look at as your bitch? If you're looking at those odds, I'll repeat them for you one more time. We got Orioles plus 650 to win the AL, plus 200 to win the AL East. Gunner plus 1800. Adley plus 2500. Corbin plus 800 for the Cy Young. Holiday plus 470 for the Rookie of the Year. 20 and a half ding dongs for Adley, 27 and a half for Tony, 27 and a half for Gunner, and 200 Ks for Burns with 172 and a half for Grayson. Who's your bitch of that group that you're like, that is. A horrible line. It's getting smashed. I think it's Santander. Again, I, I've spent half the podcast blowing him, but I, I, I think he's. I think you're he's just trying, you're trying to make up for last year. That's all that's happening right here. When you when you said he would have the biggest regression in the AL East, that's all that's happening. Pretty pretty much. Um, I get. I guess. I guess thirty three home runs twenty twenty two. He had twenty eight last year. So okay, he had less than I thought last year. I thought he was in the thirties last year. Um, I, I still again. I think the DHing helps him. I, I think the, those legs are going to be fresh. Come the end of the year, August, September, we see him group those home runs together. And maybe he's at like 28 going into like September 13th. And then he ends up with like 33 or 34 or something like that. So I, I think that's that seems like an easy one that he can get over. Brian, I feel like you were zesty on Grayson hitting 100 or 172 and a half strikeouts. How do you feel about Grayson at that number? He's gonna he's gonna be in the low two hundreds at least. Ooh, you boy. just gotta get Ooh. the innings stuff, but he's a dog. He's gonna be out there shoving. I mean, what's his K per nine? I don't have it in front of me, but it's gotta be twelve or thirteen, right? He was he was getting pretty ridiculous at one point, especially in the second half there. Uh he had last year it was nine point four. And huh? again, he struggled early on and was really inconsistent in that first little stint. And in the second half, I would wager that that number was more like 11. Uh, once he caught fire in like August, I feel like he was pushing like 11, 12. So uh, definite juice there. I think that Gunnar Henderson over 27 and a half home runs is the easiest bet on any line that I've seen in anything MLB related. Uh, I think that I I'm laddering that up. I'm going to take all the way up to 35. Uh, you can do it on DraftKings. You can ladder and do alt totals, things like that. So Love, 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 love that line. Brian, you said 40. I think Gunner was plus 280 to hit 40 home runs, which is not that long of odds. Not that long of odds. That's basically no. he stays healthy and has a good year. Like that should be within reach there. Uh, so looking to see if he catches fire early. Obviously, it was a struggle last year, struggle with left handed pitching as he was acclimating to big league pitching at the same time. So really intrigued to see how Gunner starts out. Boys, the over under is 89 and a half wins for the Baltimore Orioles. Brian, I'll start with you. 89 and a half wins coming off Way 101 over, season. Over, over, over. I mean, who's who's the injury or two injuries to this team where you're like, well, season's fucked? They're still fine. Like, mm -hmm. I feel like the worst hurt, case would be the, like the that Bradish and Means or both burns. can't come back and then like one other starter goes down and, and the bullpen's not great. And I still feel like that's that's like 89 wins still. That's that's like your worst case, and that's still 89 wins. Great. Yeah. We can get right to – I guess uh, we got a little bit more. Um, I feel like we're all going to take over 89 and a half there. We don't need to spend a ton of time on it. We can come back to do record predictions. Uh, Black Eyed Susan Spices. Shout out to the sponsor. You can go check them out at blackeyedsusanspices.com. Promo code EXIT for 10% off. EXIT52 for 10% off. Go check out – the Clyde's Cannonball Crush, a little zesty, a little spicy, a little bit more of a citrusy taste. I love it a ton. Go check that out for sure. BlackEyedSusanSpices.com. What is your hot take about this season, about this team, about where the Orioles are right now, Eric, as we're sitting on the eve of the eve of maybe even the eve, if it gets pushed to Friday, for opening day as the Orioles head into 2024? Uh, ooh, my hot take. I again, I I don't I mean listening to all the odds and stuff. I don't know. I think they win the World Series this year. I I truly think that that they will put it all together. I I tweeted out my prediction and stuff here. I don't. Know if, I picked that beat the Phillies. I don't know if it'll be the Phillies. I think they win the World Series this year. I I I have just officially talked myself into it in the last like forty hours, and, and that's that's my hot take. Take take it if you. If you if you want it, I, I think they uh they win it all. I think they win the division. I think they're the best team in the AL. I think they're they they kind of you know they they, they get that bad taste out of their mouth. They, they they get over the embarrassment, kind of like Virginia. 
um, a couple of years ago, even Texas and the uh, UBC. But uh, yeah, I think they, I think they win it all. 2024 world series champs. I have been saying for a few years, 2024 was the year, but Brian, what is your hot take? Black eyed Susan spices. What do you think is something that takes the world by storm for the Baltimore Orioles in 2024 hot take? I think my Gunnar Henderson stance is maybe the hot take, the 40 plus 110, 100 runs. Um, probably hits 310. Like, Ooh, 310 is 310 is it is high. Hot. I know. The thing is, the thing you get with the big outfield is you get a lot of real estate out there, and he's just going to be slapping balls in the corner when, when they try to pitch him away. So, um, it's like people don't realize that that's part of why there's inflated averages in, in, Den in Denver too. It's like there's so much grass out there that mm -hmm. outfielders play deeper and those jam shots fall in too. Um, but that's a whole other discussion. It's, it's Gunner. Um, are we actually doing predictions now or we're going to hold off on that? Because uh, I'll, I'll, get, I'll give my hot take. My hot take is that the Orioles acquire another superstar level player uh, before the trade deadline. I think that they have such a log jam. Again, what are you going to do with Norby? There's so many guys, so many middle infielders, which are so valuable at the spine of your team that can hit in this organization. They don't have room for all of them. They can go get another superstar. If Joey Ortiz and DL Hall is a sign of what is needed to go get a Corbin Burns level player on a rental, at least, boy, oh boy, you know, as it turns into a shorter rental, I think the Orioles go get another certified superstar to go make a run here. I, I, I am fully on board with Gunnar Henderson, MVP there. I've already placed some wagers. So that was our Black Eyed Susan Spices hot takes. Go check them out, blackeyedsusanspices.com, promo code EXIT52 for 10% off. They seriously are so spicy and so good. Check those out. Uh, so that brings us to record predictions uh, and if-thens. If this happens, then this happens for the Orioles. Uh, Brian, I'll start with you. I feel like you're you're ready to wet your whistle here. Record prediction, full prediction. Go ahead. Uh, 103 and 59. They win the AL East. They lose in the World Series. Oof. Unfortunately. I Unfortunately. Think, what, I what, what do you think fuels that? Why, why can't they get it done? What do they need? Just experience? I, I just, I know it's so chalk, but I, the Dodgers are just unreal. They're unreal. I think they're going to run into the Dodgers. Um, you said you can't think of a, another team with three just absolute superstars. Uh, LA better for Baltimore, better for Baltimore. That's my way of, that's my way of saving myself. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, Otani, they've got, they've got like 11 that's pretty good, but yeah, no, I think it's going to be a fantastic year. And I think just a world series game at the yard is going to be magical. And um, I, I, I'm, I think what I'm doing is I'm protecting myself from the idea of winning a world series and just like the idea of getting to one is just so already just next level and thing I never thought would ever happen to Baltimore that if I start thinking winning it, actually winning that series, like I'm just setting myself up for disappointment. Like I won't enjoy it as much if I actually think we're going to win it. <laughs> so if we You'll... do win it, You'll, you'll, you'll enjoy it. I promise. Regardless, you, you'll, you'll enjoy it. It'll be okay. It'll be okay, Brian. It'll be okay. If they win the world series, you'll, you'll have fun there. Eric predictions. What else you got? Empty the clip, empty the tank, leave it all out. It's the, it's the 2024 preview episode. What do you got? Uh, again, I, I said, I think they win the world series. I think they'll win a hundred on the nose. Um, I think they will. I think they'll have one of the somebody will win an award. Somebody it'll either be the rookie of the year, the MVP or the uh, uh, Cy Young. I think they win one of the big ones. Um, again, I don't know who Oh, I have my ideas. Again, I have my, my bets placed, but I'm, I just, I think they at least win one of those. Again, it could be take your pick, whichever one. Uh, I think they, there's an Oriole getting some hardware, at least one of the big ones uh, at the end of the year. Love it. I, in, for, in terms of my own personal predictions, I don't know. I, I don't think the Orioles win a hundred games and I I've, I've kind of, I don't know what it is. I, I think there's some sort of turbulence at some point this season that causes some big stir. I don't know why I can't even describe it. It's 
kind of you know lackluster analysis here, but I feel like the Orioles hit a patch that they haven't hit yet, and I think they make themselves that much better for it. I think, again, that they do go acquire a really big name that solidifies them. I feel like at this stature with Rubenstein coming in, they are not in a position to, to take steps backwards. They have a stocked farm. They have a very low payroll. They can make calculated moves. They can they have trust in their development, in their farm system, in the way that they evaluate players, the way that they build their bullpen, the pitching lab, all that good stuff. So uh, I think the Orioles are a wild card team this year. I'll say they do not win the AL East. I think that it is underrated how unbelievably hard it is to win the AL East. Brian, go ahead. Uh, pull up a tweet from Daddy Rubenstein, please. They say we have acquired Jordan Montgomery, left-handed pitcher. I'm just sorry if I cut you off there, but so it, it is quite all right. It's Brian. for the vibes. It is quite all right. What what am I missing here? Is, is this a fresh tweet? Is this is this in the DMs? What are we talking about this here? Six minutes ago. I'm looking Sir at his DM Rubenstein. DM Rubenstein. The next chapter. I just derailed the podcast. It's all right. Let's see what we got. All I see, some people call it Wednesday the. <laughs> well worth it. Well worth it. Uh, I'm gonna. I'll pull it up here on on the screen. Here, we've got Uncle Dave. Some people call Wednesday's Hump Day, but I'm thinking for this Wednesday, the next chapter sounds better. Thoughts go O's. His Twitter is just the most beloved thing that exists. Like it, he, it's. Perfect. It is so innocent, so sweet. It's a and guy who knows exactly what he's doing, too. It's very he, he's one of us. He's and he's one of us. Like we've never seen. I also feel like it's a hundred percent him, you know. Like I, I think that really is him tweeting. Like again, people are like Tom Brady's so funny on Twitter. It's not Tom Brady. It's not. Oh, Antonio Brown, he's so crazy on Twitter. That's not Antonio Brown. This is David Rubenstein. I, I think a hundred percent. So yeah, I I I love the guy. I don't know how you can't. He also quote tweeted uh, the the next chapter series and said I'll, the next chapter. I like how that sounds goes. So he's he's all about it. He's a big like media guy. He always tells everybody to go check out his YouTube and stuff too. He I, I agree with you, Eric. I think that is really him, hundred uh, oh, percent. So yeah, the next yeah. chapter it's, is upon us. It's crazy. It's crazy to think. I mean, we've been talking our entire lives about ownership changing in Baltimore, and for it to be here feels surreal. So yeah, but that is the very reason. Like I said, I think they acquire a superstar player. I think the Orioles win. At least, to finish my prediction, I think the Orioles win at least two series. Uh, I, I think that they maybe lose in the ALCS, or I'll even count the play-in game as a series there. But I think they they get through the wild card round and at least win something. They at least win a series where everyone can be like, oh my gosh. I think they're a terrifying team. Like I said, I think they go through a little adversity. I think the bullpen is a little thin on paper, has some question marks, going to take some tinkering early in the year. Uh, but they will be able to you know, at least float around that competitive area. Adley Rushman has, I'm not single saying single handedly, but since they called him up, man, I mean, they're what? What do they win? They're on like a 96 win pace. I think they're 60 games over 500. I thought I saw the graphic that said they were 169 and 109 since he came up. Yeah, and that puts they're like a it's like a 97 win pace or something since he came up. They're they're unbelievable, and and he's really you know at the center of of that success. So I think. Somebody else starts hot in the AL East, you know, whatever. We saw them hunt the Rays down last year. I feel like it's a little similar. They might not quite chase them, but I, I think this team has a lower win total, but is a much scarier, more complete, and ready to compete team than we saw last year. So I think they they win some series and go get another star player. Uh, I don't know what happens. Playoff baseball is crazy, but I love the predictions, boys. Uh, anything else? If thens, any any closing statements here again? If you're still with us. Do want to point out we will be at the Jimmy's famous seafood tailgoat coming up here 328. If rained out 329, we will be there. If you're going to the tailgoat, you see the Brady Bunch boys pointing at it. Come check us out. Come check Can't it out. It. Thank you so much to our presenting sponsor, Jimmy's Famous Seafood. Super excited to do events like this with them. Looking forward to doing yeah. some more at Jimmy's. Jimmy speaks for itself. The crab cakes, the half and half soup, the sushi, the Ooh. gunner burger. They have it all, folks. So Boys, closing closing thoughts. I will start with you, Brian. It's here, opening day, 2024. We've been waiting for it. Corbin fucking Burns, Gunnar Henderson, year two, Adley Rushman. Brian. Well, you've been talking you... X's and O's, but we, like the yard, the yard is back. 
It's the best place Ooh. on earth. Natty Bo back um, at the yard. Cola is back as well. Yes. Um, a lot of things That's to huge. like. A lot of things to like. So um, for a lot of years, like I was talking to somebody about this. Opening day seems to hold a higher regard in Baltimore than most cities. Uh, maybe that says something about what we are as a city, but I think it also says a lot about the fact that it was the best day of the year because we were kind of a joke for a lot of years. And now we're having our cake and eating it too. So um, enjoy the hell out of it, but enjoy games two through 162 as well. It's going to be a hell of a ride. Retweet. Retweet absolutely. Muted there for a second, Eric. No, again, everything. Baby. Let it, let it, let everything, it all. Lose. How are you feeling? Everything Brian said and more. Again, enjoy it. Go out there, be loud. And again, like, I mean, Brian, you're right. It used to be like, you know, go down, go downtown, you get trashed, and then you know, forty three thousand at the ballpark, and then that Saturday game, there was seven thousand nine hundred and fifty six, and it's like, oh, all right, baseball is back, baby. There's hmm. green seats as far as the eye can see. That's not going to be the case this year. Um, again, I mean, I was at take away the Freddie Gray, um, the 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 fan game with no fans. I was at the least attended game in history with like four thousand people on a cold April night. Um, saw Dylan Bundy give up a grand slam. Uh, no, who was it? Nestor Cortez Jr. gave up a grand slam for the Orioles as a Rule Five pick. Um, those days are done. We're we're done with these with these you know the shitty attendance and all that. The jokes are over. Again, this is a, a new chapter, some would say. Uh, but it's just – it's awesome that baseball is back. Again, I feel like they were just losing in the playoffs, and now here we are with, you know, Spenny, you just said it, Corbin fucking Burns going on the bump. Uh, T-minus two, maybe three days. So go out and enjoy it. Uh, it's going to be a great year. Everyone just just kind of breathe. It's going to be all right. We're, we're going to lose some games. They'll win a little more than they lose. But, uh, again, it's just – it's going to be a great year. It's going to be a very fun one. In my, in my doing of more of a host role in this episode, I, I want to echo a sentiment that I know one Jake Luke has, who often hosts for me, is that don't take this time for granted. This is my 31st year on this planet. I have been an Orioles fan since I can remember any of those years. And I've never in my life been as excited by the prospects of, uh, there's so many guys, but Corbin Burns, Gunnar Henderson, Adley Rushman, new ownership. I know you can get into the nitty gritty. I know that winning comes with expectations, expectations, and I'm not here to tell you how to fan. Fan how you want to fan. If you want to, you know, freaking smack yourself in the face and scream to your face is red and, you know, cry into a pillow, that's fine. I've, I've done it myself, but enjoy this stuff, man. The yard is beautiful. New ownership, superstar players in Baltimore. Kim Yards is, this is the pinnacle right now of my fandom as a Baltimore, in my life of being an Baltimore Orioles fan. I'm so excited. Can't wait. Get to the yard. This is the year. This is what you have been quote unquote waiting for your entire life. So don't take it for granted. Are the Orioles going to win the World Series? I mean, maybe, probably not. That's not a great way to live if you're, if it's World Series or bust every year when you're coming from the gutter for, for much of your existence. So have fun with this team. Root them on. Go enjoy Cammy Yards. Go get yourself a Natty Bow and a nice Coca-Cola and a nice crab dog and enjoy mm -hmm. these superstar players. Fellas, this was an hour and 37 minutes. I love you both. This was fantastic. Again, Brian, give, Brian, give us a rat couple. Hit us with a couple, Brian. You got to get the face going for it really to click there. There you go. Bam. That was the one. So, boys, this was a hell of a lot of fun. Looking forward to this season. Like and subscribe on YouTube. Download the podcast, share it with a friend, all that good stuff. We love you. We love the Baltimore Orioles. We're super excited. Jimmy's Famous Tailgate, Thursday or Friday, whichever it is, we will be there. And hit us up. DM us. Tweet at us. Eric, you've met up with maybe 15,000 people that I've seen just with my own eyes at games. So if you want a buddy, if you're like, man, I really would love to go in an Orioles game. I don't have anybody to go with. We're always there. We're always there for you. If you need somebody to talk with, we're here for you. We love you. We love the Orioles. I think that about does it, fellas. Any, anything else? at all i can get us out of here all right that about does it about an hour and 40 minutes here thank you so much for listening follow the podcast at exit 52 podcast on twitter instagram facebook eric is at edittitti22 brian is at barstool banks taylor is at taylor smythe 10 jake at jake luke that's l-o-u-q-u-e i am at ravens four dummies that's the number four baltimore orioles baseball is back baseball is here fuck yes we love it with that, appreciate you.
We are getting the hell out of here.